since um, 2002, and a couple things I've gotten into over the years came by way of um, reacquainting with my uh, university, with Penn State. I didn't go through an astronomy program there. I went through electrical engineering and graduate business school. But some years later, when my kids were small, I went back up and I had an interest in astronomy and got talking to those guys. And um, they put me onto a program that Penn State is a co-manager of with NASA, a satellite program called SWIFT, which looks for gamma ray bursts. And we can talk about that here at the end of the presentation, um, a Yahoo group I set up to go and cover that stuff. But along the way, um, a couple things have happened. So with the... With, uh, growth of the internet and you know this more or less ubiquitous service all around the world um, particularly at scientific sites um, there's a program that came out of University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill called Skynet that was funded in part by the National Science Foundation it gets some funding from the state of North Carolina um, they're transitioning now to a model to um, to have some paid use of their telescopes to fund the programs and, that, and that's how NSF prefers things to go anyway they don't want them they don't want people to be come to them every year for the same grant money for the same project. So um, Skynet, um, you know, the guys, it was a bit of a yuck. If you've ever seen the Terminator with Arnold Schwarzenegger and the rise of the machines, and it, they were, you know, lampooning that. And uh, they named the they named this uh, particular network of robotically controlled telescopes. Uh, Prompt is what it is. T uh, technically it's called, but they call it Skynet more basically. And they use it for... Um, instruction with University of North Carolina students uh, with their astronomy courses. They have outreach with other universities around the state. Uh, they have some outreach with us. Um, we're, we're a club. Um, they, a number of different people come to them. But the system was designed, um, just a little bit about gamma ray bursts and how they work. It's a, those are extra galactic phenomena where uh, there, there's basically two models. One is a, a creation of, at, the, at the time of the creation of a supernova. Um, you get this gamma radiation that can be detected sometimes from Earth. There's another model where um, I believe for a long time two neutron stars were merging and that amount of energy um, created some gamma radiation because there's uh, nuclear activity in the atom going on that, that releases that energy. And um, if it's pointed, if, if the uh, gamma radiation is pointed in the right direction and there's stuff between that source and us, it lights it up, it heats it up, and uh, you can observe it in visual spectrum, ultraviolet spectrum, infrared spectrum. So um, these robotic telescopes were set up, six, or six of them originally, I think, and each, uh, they're Ritchie Sheraton telescopes. They're not parabolic, they're hi hyperbolic um, mirrors. They're good for scientific um, st application for, for bringing down FITS files, not like we typically do with our visual observing. And um, they pull in uh, that data the um, mirrors have a little bit different emulsions on each one of them, so they can build a light curve pretty quickly of uh, what they see uh, in the sky with these afterglows that, that many times only last a few minutes. So it was important with this application they made to the National Science Foundation to show, well, if we go and design these scopes with different emulsions on the primary mirrors, we don't have to spin a filter wheel, which lots of times is going to jam or, or it won't work properly or what have you. That was the basic design. Um, but gamma ray bursts don't happen all the time. I mean, maybe on average one a day, and it's a fraction of those that have some visible component. And um, because of that, they've got a whole lot of downtime. So uh, with that downtime, they decided to use it for outreach. And uh, this has grown because there's a, a group of scopes in, in Chile, in the, uh, in, in the Andes, um, that were the primary group, and they still are pretty much the primary group. And uh, there's an internet connection there. It's probably fiber uh, in that part of the world back to the servers at uh, Chapel Hill in North Carolina. And then there's another set of scopes in Australia, uh, Siding Springs Observatory. They're currently down. It's the same, um, same type of telescopes, but they have to take a trip over there to go and figure out some mechanical problems. Uh, that group are all uh, coincident under the same dome, or it's an observatory area with maybe six of these telescopes. And then they have agreements around the world with other different universities. So, for example, there's one on uh, just due, I guess it would be due east of Perth, Australia, that they use. Um, there's one, uh, there's two, um, and in and around um, uh, Asheville, Dark Sky Observatories they use there. But the idea is anybody who's on that network, and I'll show you when we get to the interface, um, can go ahead and load programs, run their jobs, and and uh, we have the ability to do that here with Novak at no charge to our members. So a couple folks have 
signed up and been using it. Um, I've been using it. There's a curriculum that comes along with it, and I've used it uh, in some part to get familiar with the system, but you know, it also allows you to go off on tangents and take a look at you know, some things you might want to do on, uh, on your own without following the certificate program all the way through. And uh, the way they've um, endorsed this for the public is if you, take all, if you take all eight labs and go through to the um, uh, conclusion of it, you earn a certificate. Not, it's not like a Messier certificate, but University of North Carolina will provide mm -hmm. a, a uh, certificate for you like, like you would with any other observing program. Okay, um, this is going to be live, so always, there's always a little bit of risk with live demos, but it's the best way to show this, and um, I'm going to be bouncing around a little bit. I have a, you'll, s you'll see up here, I'm going to have a, uh, an outline that I work with as I kind of step through this because I've got to go bring up certain uh, parts of the application to look at and show you how to do it. Um, the Green Bank 20 meter telescope with south here about an hour is on the network and uh, if I can get that to work I can show you there's a screen we have in here that shows the actual location uh, in the sky that these uh, telescopes are pointing and if I can get that to run get it to go and kick off real time we'll, we'll be able to move the dish and I asked them um, you know we have people going down there right now actually but I asked uh, the head of education at Green Bank if they could go out with a camera and take a picture of it moving. But, you know, if you know anything about Green Bank, it's no-no, it's radio quiet, not even cell phones. So, so I have to show you here. Okay. This can also be interactive. If you have questions while we're going through it, just say, hey, Tom, stop and explain that to me because there's a lot to cover. This is their main portal. And I'm going to cover this uh, at the beginning from the educational value of it first, what they're trying to do with uh, the program, because it's a university and they're trying to promote knowledge and they're trying to promote use of the, um, use of the system for academic value. So um, you go to this page called Intro Astro, and, and by the way, I'm, I've, I've got a lot of this in a spreadsheet. It's with links to where you can go to find your way through this if you want to get that after the presentation, I'll email it to you. But this uh, describes the program a little bit. Some of the information I just gave you. Um, when you see here, astronomy with Skynet, that's the uh, non-credit. I mean, you don't have to pay for it. You, it's not, you have to pay for credit hours in state or out of state to use those. Um, but that's the uh, certificate program that, that you have access to through the club. Let me see what I can link to here. YouTube videos are very good. Yeah. They're, uh, you, you bring up a good point. There's there's a lot of material here. It's it, what you need to do is you have to make a commitment. Um, this is a Facebook page. I really don't want to dig there too much because I don't use Facebook. Um, this is going to go as well as you're able to commit time to learn how to make it work. There's plenty of tutorials out there. Um, when I go out to them and ask them a question about something that's not technically re related to doing a demo like this or something I want to do, they kind of spank me and say, go, go look at this tutorial, you know, because they don't have time. I mean, they're, they're teaching classes down there and they're building the network and, you know, it's, uh, it's Dan Reichert, who's the head of the program. He's uh, the, the uh, head of the astronomy department at UNC and uh, a couple grad assistants and one guy they keep on board there is a software developer to, to do the interface work. Um, but that's the basic kind of first way in here to see uh, see how you get into it. Um, if I take you to courses, they're gonna the other thing you need to understand about this is they're uh, in a university environment. They're they're many times optimistic. Like they'll have they'll have up that we have this course coming in um, lunar design or, or lunar study or things of that nature, and they're just they're two years away from it. But they have it up on their website anyway. Not that it's up and ready to go, but they. Uh, it's coming up. It's just it's a lot of work for them, and I, I think they do a great job. But it does have kind of a personality to it. I'm going to take you to WebAssign, and if you have kids in college or you ever used it, it's a um, got to get through this. The um, if you've ever used this, it's a. a educational grading mechanism, although you're not being graded on the courses that you take here. It, um, you're uh, being graded for completeness. So if you go and you submit the assignments, you know, as they come up and there's no, there's no time, uh, there's no time uh, limit to, there's no time limit to how long it takes you to take these, uh, 
these courses. Okay. Anybody got some questions here while I'm navigating? I'm going to be doing this, and I feel like I'm not going to be talking while I'm trying to go get this to go where it needs to go. Questions so far? Come on, guys. You have to help me out here. <laughs> yeah, I've done this so many times, I just got to go plug through it. But, um, all right, so what the sign's going to ask me for a class key, which I have. That's a um, good question. The, uh, we have this, is if you want to take this course, it's an individual effort, okay? So this is my key because I'm, I'm taking the courses. Okay, what we're doing with uh, making it available to the club is giving you access to the PDF copies of the labs that are not graded. You can go in and take a look at them and, and it'll tell you how long to take certain exposures, you know, what you can point at, how to set up a run, all that stuff's in the tutorials. And the labs will help you get through the first couple of those. You don't have to sign up for WebAssign to do this. You don't have to. You can go. Um, I'll make those links available for you too to go step through the different things to get it going. But um, the first lab or two, they give you okay. Point at these objects. Um, there's a database you could load. I'll show you here in a little bit. I loaded up the lagoon uh, night before last and got some decent images of those from Chile. And um, It'll help you step through all this. It'll give you some some data, so you're not totally flying, uh, flying blind out there. Uh, well, it's they've designed it so that um, I'll say this: they've designed this so that you can't really break it. I mean, there's the, this design so if something you know really shouldn't be happening with the mount. Um, goes on, it gets scrubbed. But the, um, I'll tell you the scary thing is when I knew they, yeah, a lot of this I do for my kitchen table at home. It's just it's so easy to do it now. Um, Dan told, and you have a dialogue with Dan, the uh, professor at UNC, and uh, he told me they just bought the 20 meter dish online. And I went and I looked, and there it was, and I just I queued up um, Cassiopeia, which is a really loud radio source. And then watched it slew to it. And I'm sitting here. I'm, there's no controls. <laughs> there's nobody. There's no. There's nothing they could have done to say, you know, don't log on here. Go ahead and, and move that dish. And you figure, how many tons of equipment that's got to be? You know, we'll do it in a little bit. We'll just go look for a, a, a site. But it just it's really. Um, if you're doing something that you were gonna, you were going to lock them out or something in that nature, it's got some, you know, programmatically, it's got some things in there or safeguards. Okay. Yeah, we are. I've put in requests in the morning while I'm doing my morning stuff, and I check at lunch, and it's done. And sometimes this time of year, because they're all back to school and they're all in their first week or two of Astronomy 101 and using it, and not, it's not just UNC, it's also some of these other North Carolina universities. It's 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 busy. Yeah. But, um, Maybe you have to wait a day or two if it's weather at that particular place, or it's not up. Yeah, we'll look at that in a minute. So I'm not going to stay too long on the education part of it to promote it, but Dan wants me to, and I'm, I'm doing it because I'm helping him promote the program. And, and they're, they're using a, a very university-oriented mindset here. They want you to do self-paced learning, and they want you to be able to go and have a mechanism to do that. Um, I'm in the web design account. This costs, I think, 45 or $65, and you get half an hour telescope time with it. And half an hour doesn't sound like much, but your exposures are sometimes one second or three tenths of a second. It you know, depends what you're shooting in the pretty powerful scopes. So it does, it does last for a while. So how do they charge you? Only by the camera time that is actually taking the picture, that not the time and set up? And that's a good question, Richard. Yeah, it's, it's all budgeted and in they've changed the portal now and it's, um, you get assigned credits. And a credit is essentially a second, okay? But you're right, you're not, you're not waiting for it to slew and take the, it's exposure time. Yeah. Perfect. yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, they don't want to. You know what happens if it slews and it jams? You know, something like that. You can't be tick. You can't be ticking up. 
And I think this is basically, I think there's a lot of programs now. I haven't really investigated it yet, but there's a lot of programs where you can buy telescope time now. Um, so let's go down here, take a look at uh, blah, 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 blah. how to observe moons, because I did one here I want to show you. This lab is, um, there's a little bit of a discussion in there. There is a video to watch. And then here in that table, it shows you, um, it wants the students to go through and um, take images of those different locations. I'm going to show you how to do that in the portal here in a minute. But um, I did Uranus the last couple nights and uh, got some pretty decent images with that. There's an astrometry program. Do you know what astrometry, astrometry programs are? Applications? Okay, they take, um, this data comes back not just as pixelation for imaging, it comes back with information per pixel. Okay, so you can tell, for example, based on the magnification and, and where you are, you can measure the arc distance across an object. You can measure um, the arc distance between two points. Uh, one of the labs, and um, I supplemented that a little bit, Dr. Geller over at GMU gave me a project to work on and asked me to present on Asteroid Day last year, I guess. and. Uh, I followed Interomnia, which is a asteroid, for a couple nights, and you could see it move against the background of the stars, and you get those kinds of those kinds of images. Um, I can show you that here in a minute. Just um, that particular lab I was on. Uh, had this um, image two nights ago. And uh, if any of you went to Rod's presentation last night and you talked about Stellarium, Stellarium is a requirement for the courses. It's free, but it's required. So I had to go on and look at, um, I can show you when I get into the astrology tool. It gives you image information, for example, exactly what time the image was taken. And, and you can pick that in universal time. Or you can pick that in the time of the observatory, which is in Chile. And then if you go into Stellarium and you go look at that object and you set the time to match identically, well, you can see where the moons are and label them. So that's an example of, a, of one particular assignment that goes with these labs as you're doing them. You have to submit it, and when, the, um, when WebAssign goes and takes a look at it, they determine versus Stellarium whether you got things in the right place or not, and whether or not you pass that one particular, uh, that one particular element. I mean, it would take an hour just to demo that just by itself. Here you see some of these things. I mean, they're not pretty pictures. I mean, this is a this is a uh, image of Cirrus. Um, if you're in the program, you could measure the distance across that object, and you get some uh, you get angular diameter of the object. So if you knew how far away it was, and you knew something about the orbital characteristics, you could use the math and come up with some information about its mass. Um, they teach you that in the course. Um, there you see a picture or an image of an example of measuring angular diameter across an object. Uh, this is some of my stuff that was submitted. So uh, you see down here, uh, when I took through, a, whenever I took the class, I guess Mercury and Venus are too close to the sun, we never do that. But I picked up all these other um, observations and logged in when I met them or made them or what have you and then loaded the pictures up and they check it and I get credit for it. So um, that's typically how it works. This is another, see if I have any images I loaded. Here's another example what I've, um, what I've shown you with the moons of Uranus that we took. Okay. Here are some moons of Saturn and it gives you an example of what it should look like. And then I had an upload a file after I took the images and that was my, um, that's the data I captured. So that gets uploaded and they take a look at it and if it's right they give you credit for it and you get a little green check mark. I might have one or two in here where I have a red check mark because I either didn't do it or didn't get loaded in time. But you get the idea. So I'm going to move off that. That's the, if you want to take the actual course where you're paying $65 and getting your own computer time, that's what you do. And I can help you get there if you have some interest in pursuing that. Um, the very the first lab, and that's what I was showing you, um, has you uh, gives you some ideas about what how much exposure time you need for certain um, certain items. This was the Lagoon Nebula taken two nights ago from uh, Chile, and um, I've got some uh, I've got some latitude in terms of what I can do to go and get con more contrast out of the image, or maybe to make that 
center a little less bright so I can get some more structure out of when I'm looking at it. But um, in this particular case, I took three images. Um, they're probably each one second long, and they were, um, I used a red to green and a blue filter. Because you know, a lot of times if you look at those nebula, a lot of people go and look at it with filters to kind of get different pieces of the detail out of it. So, um, you know, that came up, uh, you know, clear and clear sky and no wind, I would guess. It's at 7,000 feet there. It gets, uh, it can get pretty nasty. But um, you'll get the, uh, even if you don't sign up for the course, the first lab or two that you can use as examples will tell you what to point at and uh, how much time to take. So now it's probably a good idea to take it to the portal for this. Okay, this is the current version of the portal. And it's uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, we have an account for Novak, and uh, I can give you the, if, if, well, I'd like it if anybody's interested in following up on this afterwards, you just give me your name and your email address, and I'll put you on the list and give you the, the username and password. It's very simple. Um, I haven't worked out with Terry yet. We have to buy time on this. So I haven't worked out with Terry yet. When we get to the point where we're almost out of um, credits, we have to buy more time, and it's $75 an hour. But I think the club would be able to afford to do that and just have to work it you know, talk to Terry about and tell him what we're doing. Um, here's a little bit about the sites that we were talking about. I can get over there. Um, Siding Springs is in Australia. That's offline at the moment. But to get some information about that location and the scopes. Um, this is the main set of telescopes in Chile. There's uh, one each underneath the um, each one of those clamshell domes on their own mount. And then the one in Australia, same types of telescopes, but they're all included in one observatory area. So I'll give you some information about it there. Um, I can give you a better rendering of this if I do. This was the backup in case things weren't working out. This is um, North Carolina Chapel Hill where their observatory is. That's the programs run from there. And if they don't have the servers on campus, they're somewhere like uh, Amazon Web Services. They probably outsource it. There's another look at the clamshell domes in that location. And that's Dan Riker. He runs the program. And one of the telescopes. Uh, you can see here it's a uh, RC Optical Systems is the designer. 16-inch coded primary objective, F9. And uh, a little bit of stats about the cameras. That, cam that in particular has a 10-minute by 10-minute field of view. And pixel resolution isn't, I mean, if you do astrophotography, you're going to take a look at that and say 1024 by 1024, boy, that's pretty, uh, that's pretty granular. It's not, uh, it's not fine. And there's a reason for that. These are not meant, these are not meant to be, uh, you know, high definition imaging for satisfaction of getting a really good shot. They're made to go and do scientific work and, and uh, bring down files you can actually work with. This is the uh, southeastern Australia. Observatory Siding Springs, same telescopes in one housing. And yeah, it just gives you a little bit of background about that. Uh, tch -tch -tch. All right, Afterglow is the astrom astrometry, I can never say it right, astrometry program we use for handling images, so. Just show you where you draw those from, the types of things you can do with it. So I'm logged on under our club account, and this is these last th these last three uh, files or the data I pulled down just within the last uh, 48 hours. So let's go look at this. This is Uranus with the moons I showed you. Uh, what I showed you was two nights ago. This is from well, last ask, night. Yeah, go ahead. I'm not quite sure what your message is. Because you seem to be 
saying that there are uh, telescopes or observatories for the good locations high altitude huh? to which amateurs can get access uh, to use them. Uh, and then, what's the list? There should be several of these kinds of places. Uh, you told us two so far, right? Well, there's a, the list of telescopes that are on the system. Again, this is the university being optimistic. They may have written agreements or, or an agreement on understanding about using, like Yerkes is on it, you know, in Chicago. But I've never seen a Yerkes run. As long as I've been working with this, I've been working with it for about two years. Your question was what the purpose of it. What was the first thing you said? The purpose of it or the direction of it? Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's self-paced learning. You know, they're, they're trying to use this as a, uh, you know, you can do online learning courses or what have you. They're trying to bring the capabilities of this network to the public. As part of, you know, when they apply for grants at uh, NSF, just about any NS NSF grant that you apply for has to have some outreach component to it. So, um, you know, this yeah, is. So, who are the real targets and students? Is, is this part of an astronomy course at, at college and university? Are they targeting high school kids? amateur astronomers like us, it, it looks like they don't want you just to go and take a picture. You, you gotta pay your dues and prove that you're interested in astronomy. You learn material and then at, to graduate they let you take some pictures. Yeah, well, no, it's not quite, it's not, it's not well, no, it's not quite that. They, <coughs> you know, they wanna, it, it gives visibility to their program. Um, they want people to do, it's, a, it's an educational institution, it's a university, so they want, they want you to learn, okay, they want to promote it as an educational benefit. Um, it, taking pictures and trying to get the hang of it is basically what you need to do when you're getting started with this, because I don't think, it, I, I wouldn't recommend anybody just dive in and do the certificate thing right away, because there's a time commitment. Um, I started doing this a year, maybe a year ago. Two years ago, I started using the network and getting involved with it only a year ago to sign up for the courses, and I'm only through the first two, completely through the first two labs. Um, I've gotten off on a tangent in some cases. The second lab has to do with phases of Venus and um, rotation of uh, Galileo's moons around Jupiter. So are you taking pictures right along? Yeah, this is, I took this one, one last okay, night, so Richard. You're There are two. There are two classes that. Uh, that's a very good point too. If you keep asking me questions, I think I'll get it all out. So <laughs> it's um, if the uh, the structure of the course is, we all know about the cosmic distance ladder, for measuring cosmic distance. We started with parallax, and then we observe variable stars, and we're able to go and group some based on their periodicity. And then we can make some inferences how far away something was if it had the same periodicity but was four times as faint. And we started to use that for, for measuring or gauging distance across the, across the Milky Way. And then, uh, you know, Jesus, it's been 100 years ago now already when Hubble proposed the redshift theory. So th they go through all that, okay? Um, you can actually take the course, the, the Astronomy 101 course at University of North Carolina. He's got all the um, lessons on YouTube. I mean, it's a time commitment if you want to do that. And um, at first, they wanted you to sign up for out-of-state credit to take the course. Well, you know, that's kind of a push. I, I, I don't think there'd be too many people signing up to do that, unless you're a college student and you wanted to take an astronomy course and it wasn't offered near where you live. But, um, but just to give you an idea, this was, this was shot last night in the, in the lab. I mean, if you take it from the standpoint of, well, I got a pretty picture of this planet and the moon's surrounding this planet. Um, that's one level. If you take it to the next level with this program, you can measure the angular distance across something. I'll, I'll just zoom in here real quick. Okay. I know this to be the right target because I checked, and I'll show you the moons here in a minute. I can use this tool, and I can measure... Oops. Where are you? There you go. I get the, if you see up here, I get the, it's one and a half arc minutes across that, across that disk. So you remember a little bit of your geometry and trigonometry, or trigonometry if you could, if you knew how far away it was and you knew the angular size of it and you knew the orbital characteristics, I mean, Kepler has equations about determining the mass from that information. And that gets taught in the course. 
It doesn't, you're not going to get drilled to death with math and calculus and all that stuff, but it'll, it steps you through, well, this is what Kepler and Galileo were looking at, and this is the math that was applied to it at the time. You might have to answer a couple questions after you take some measurements like this and see that they come out, and that's all part of the learning, um, the learning exercise. But what you can do with this <coughs> is, um, I mean, you see the disk there. I have uh, the ability with this has to do with actually managing the contrast and the brightness of the object. So I can bring this down to that. And if I go a little more fine-tuned here, that's too much. You see the moons? See them here, here, here? Okay, I can zoom in on them. You know, setting this up, I can show you afterwards. You come up here and look on this PC. I have Stellarium set up to exactly this point in time. If I look at uh, image information, I can see this was taken at some September 3rd in all market for universal time, and you'll get the time of the exposure. And I can go into Stellarium and pull that up. And lo and behold, those moons will be, the, they may be inverted based on, you know, what, what type of telescope and uh, configuration I had at the, uh, at the focal plane. But uh, you can very easily tell which moon is which from Stellarium. And then one of the exercises, if you were doing this for credit, would be to label those moons and submit it. And then you get credit for it if it's correct and you don't know if it's not. So um, that should give you some ideas of basically how it works. Um, the components you need uh, without taking the certificate program, you need me to give you the Novak account, and there's nothing to that. I can do it for any one of you that wants to follow up and do this and try it out. Um, and you need to download Stellarium, and that's free. Okay? If you want to take the courses after you've fooled around with it for a couple months, you can go in and um, sign up for that on WebAssign. You get your own time, and you get your own account to do that with. So um, I've collected enough data fooling around with this and doing demos on it and talking to people. Um, you know how we take an image at night, we have to get it, and then we have to go post-process it right away and get the color out of it. With this stuff, I've collected data, and I've gotten, they never scrap your files. So everything we have in here, all those files came through the Novak 2 account from you know, back there two years ago. These are some of the first ones I did just fooling around with it, but they never take them off the server. So you can go back and look at your work. I mean, the point there is uh, I've taken these images and I know I need them to answer a question or two with one of the labs. I have the data. I just have to go back and, and use that tool to parse things out of it and go through it. Okay. Other questions? Move on to the next step here. Fits, yes, it's fits. Yes, if you want to. Yeah, I mean, if you have your own program. Like, um, I forget, some, some of them you can get from the Smithsonian Foundation. I forget what the name of it is. Do you know? Yeah. Well, that's what we were just looking at with Afterglow. That's what that does. It's, it's their custom, I mean, it's North Carolina's custom program. But, so for example, you could go... Uh, there's a couple different categories of them. One is just the YouTube videos that go along with um, the um, pull up the tutorials. There are um, video tutorials that go along with the labs and how to use it. Okay, so that's the first set, and I can give you the link for that. So any one of these, did someone you, did you ask me if I could run a video here? Is it? You think, is there anything else I need to do? Um, these first. Well, if it's HDMI, I should pick it up. Uh, well, actually, you have to bring it into the mixing. Oh, mix your board, yeah. We'll just do one here real quick. Because it's going to segue me over to showing you how to load a job. All right, uh, go ahead. And it should 
should come on. <laughs> Welcome to the Skynet video tutorial series. In this video, we're going to talk about how to put a job in on Skynet. And this video is I'm going to let this run because uh, this is where I was going next anyway. So we'll just go ahead and let you take a look here. <coughs> so basically, once you already have an account and uh, you have time on that account, then you can follow along with this video. Um, once you log in, as you can see, I'm going to make a general account here. You'll see the My Observatory page. This is where all the magic happens. If you've never put in a job before, there won't be anything in this list, and that's okay. Uh, however, if you load it up and it looks like this, and you see this magic error message here about no telescope time, you're going to want to go ahead and talk to your TA or your instructor because you can't put any jobs in if you don't have any time. Makes sense. Um, now, this new website has a lot of features. You can check out all the links and everything you can do. Uh, but in this video, I'm really only going to talk about optical observations. Okay, so that's right over here on this link. And when you click that, it's going to load up this page. Now, by default, it'll look like this. Um, however, this brand new feature we have called the Sky Viewer. I'm going to do a separate video on that so that hopefully I can keep this video from being too long. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hide that. Now when you, look, when you want to look up something in Skynet, for example Saturn, you just type in the name of the object and then hit enter or click that look up button. And Skynet will automatically look up where this object is and whether or not it's going to be visible for the telescopes you have access to. So lab users have access to Prompt, which is in Chile, and Prompt SSO, which is in Australia. And what happens as soon as you look up an object is you get put down here into the uh, air mass chart or visibility chart. Basically, this tells you whether or not you should keep going. Um, so in this example, down here in the left uh, is right now, and it shows you one day into the future. The uh, y-axis is how high in the sky the object is. So the left uh, y-axis is elevation, the right y-axis is air mass. It tells you the exact same thing. <coughs> Essentially, when you put an object in, you're going to want to make sure that this line here at 20 degrees or 3 air mass, you want to make sure your target is above that line, um, So, which is true for both of these cases. So that's good. We can go on here. Um, now, I tell people to add a little bit more description here. So if this is lab one, go ahead and type that in. If you're having fun, go ahead and type that in. So you, you just add a little bit more to the name so that when you're looking up this data later, you know, you'll, you'll remember which one's which. Okay, so you click next. It's going to bring up our filter page. Now, if you're a seasoned veteran, you can go ahead and go through and pick the uh, filter that you need. But uh, we're implementing a new feature this uh, this semester on uh, generic um, filters, which is basically grouping filters that have similar characteristics together so that we can uh, put your job across more telescopes and hopefully expedite the process of getting your data back. So if you click on high through, you know, whatever the lab says, um, that will be high throughput, meaning open or clear or loom, see that here. Um, and that's just going to let basically all of the light through, uh, which lets us use eight telescopes, eight different telescopes. So when we click next, it's going to show us all eight of those telescopes. Um, and in this lab, you want to go ahead and pick all of them. It doesn't mean it's going to happen eight times. All it means is you're casting a wider net across more telescopes so that you can potentially get your job back faster. So we're going to go ahead and click next there. And the last page is, second to last page, is the exposures. Uh, most exposures will be one. And this is a very bright planet, so it says our max is 0.1. I'm just going to go ahead and do the max. You don't. You know, the point here is you can't over you can't overexpose and hurt the camera. You can overexpose, but you can't. That's a that's a stopgap, so they don't. Yeah. Overhead operations that happen with every exposure, and we want to make sure that those are accounted for. So basically, um, no matter what, the minimum is one second deduction. But you're given 30 minutes to start the lab, so there's plenty of time. Um, now you're going to click next. And this is the final page, which is just a confirmation page to make sure that you got everything in there that you thought you had. And so when you push submit here, it's going to add a new row to your list of observations, and it's going to be active. And if it all goes well, that should get observed tonight, or you know, it could be right now if Australia is open and it's full time, that, that could happen. Um, and now every, every object you're supposed to look at, you just want to go ahead and repeat that process.
Okay. Lots of those. So um, you got more than enough to get you started here and to get you in trouble with trying to figure out how to make all this stuff work. So I, I found it to be very helpful. I've had to sometimes go back through things two or three times. I think that's normal. Um, but uh, I've already taken you through some of this. I mean, he, the last thing I was going to show you is the portal. And I'm still going to go there. Uh, after it was what I showed you, that we manipulate the images and save them and use them to upload if you're taking the certificate course. Um, anybody use Solarium? Richard, you and I were looking at it last night, right? Do you ever use that before? You used it before? Or you had your own? You have your own program? Yeah. Um, I, I think it's great. Works, does everything I need to do there. So um, you'll see down here graphing linear data. There's a couple things. Like the next thing I'll end up doing is looking at variable stars. And there's some tools in there that help you figure out periodicity of variable stars um, based on your observations. That's kind of where I'm going next. The part on planets and uh, I, I can show you here in my, uh, my field book. Um, I decided with Venus and checking out the phases of Venus to actually go and, and do that for a year or through a, uh, you know, a cycle. And um, you can't really do that with the with one of these telescopes. You're too close to the sun most of the time. But there's a site on the web that the U.S. Naval Observ Observatory uses. Um, let me show you here. Yes, I know. Um, planet phase. Parent disk, a solar system object. Uh, I, I just, you know, there's so much of this stuff online. If you're curious, you just like, boom, there that is. I didn't know anything about it. So we're going to look at Venus um, now. And it's going to pull up this information, and you're going to see, if we could look at it close enough, you can see the phase it's in. Okay. That data along the bottom of it tells you what the what phase it is, what the angular diameter is. Um, I've done things, for instance, like in my... I can show you here my field book, but I've I've tried to go and, and uh, use a protractor and a small ruler and pick out the angular tilt of it, and then I sketch it in my field book. Um, and that's I'm collecting all this data, but if I want to go back and look and say, well, is this angular tilt caused because of you know our inclination to the ecliptic at that time of year, or you know whatever it comes up with, I got some information. I can go back and take a look at. So I, I just it's a project that's kind of ongoing, but I haven't had to sit down and go through. Okay, we got it. Yeah, I mean, this systematically... Yeah, this systematically is the way it's taught. I mean, you if you remember when you went to college and, and you essentially start out with, I mean, your math goes through the sequence of, you know, how things were learned and how things were discovered. Um, they're, what I've noticed with this program these practice labs that you don't have to take the course for, and, and the courses all go through this, these stepping stones of modern astronomy, if you consider Kepler and, and uh, Galileo as, and, and you have to, I would think you have to consider Kepler and Galileo as modern astronomy. I think it's not, it's not, it's not prehistoric stuff. It's not, yeah. So uh, you go, th they decide to do this by going and taking Earth observations and planetary and I mean, a Kepler and Galileo is a heliocentric universe versus a Earth-centric universe. And, I mean, we all know the story that Galileo ended up under home arrest and, you know, all these things. But um, 
he, the lab goes through what, what he saw, what he observed, what he inferred from that, and that's kind of what got me off on this Venus thing. I was like, well, you know, you can infer something about the orbit. Like for the last four months, I do it once a month and I sketch it in my book. The last four months, it's been full the entire time. And the thing crosses your mind first is why isn't that changing phases as it moves around the sun? And the reason is we're chasing it around the sun. So it always appears full because there's a period of time and we're just, until it catches up again, that we're, we're doing that. So, I, you know, it just, it, it doesn't take a whole lot of time to do that. I don't get out as, uh, at night as much as I used to, to with my scope. And then when I do, I've got these other things I want to do with it. it um, the next thing I'm probably going to be doing is, is variable stars. And, uh, you know, we uh, hosted the Astronomical League when they had their annual meeting over here in D.C. a month ago, a couple weeks ago. And uh, picked up their carbon star program, which is a variable star program. So I'll probably do that. Um, if I can figure out with this network how to go and measure magnitudes in different wavelengths, if that's part of the um, if that's part of the uh, curriculum, we could do that. Um, they sh he showed you, and he said this was the most recent portal of it. That's already a year old. This is the most recent portal, and just came out like three four weeks ago. Um, it's pretty much the same um, stuff. What I'm going to do here is just show you this. I'm going to log into my account. And we're going to try to do that green bank green bank thing. Sorry. All oh, that. Yeah, I know. Pterodactyl. Um, there have been a couple different renditions of this. Um, I can put the I can put the constellation names up and where they are. Um, and each one of the scopes, you see they're color coded. And if I go up here, you see the color code on the left, right? And um, at night, because we're we're Within an hour of, of the chili scopes, you know, in terms of uh, time zones, uh, you can see where they're um, they're focusing on. And then they'll finish a job and they'll drift over to this or drift over to that. They're locked. Somebody locked these three scopes. It's daytime and they're just you know at rest under the dome. Um, but if it was nighttime, you'd see this. The the coolest thing happened with this when I first signed up for it because I was doing that gamma ray burst stuff and that got me introduced to Dan. And remember I told you about the afterglow utility of it so that if one went off and they thought there was a visible component they use these telescopes to train on it and they reach sensitive in certain wavelengths so they can get a light curve so i'm sitting at my uh, kitchen table it was probably the second time i had this interface up and um it was the funniest thing i was just because it was nighttime and you could see him finish in a 30 second run here and then move into here or you could see this one finish in a 10 second run here and you can see it while it's slewing and down here in the, um, it'll tell you what what the telescope's doing if it's slewing or if it's exposing. You get to see that live, um, but all of a sudden, like these three or four, all went like beep 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 beep. All four, all of them went over to one spot, and I knew immediately that's what it had to be because it was that's was what it was designed to do. And I have another source when this stuff comes off the satellite to know that the the burst has occurred and the coordinates are being relayed out to everybody. And I flipped over to it, and sure enough, they just within the, within a minute. Um, that information gets pushed out. To, it's less than that. I mean, the, the professional community is within seconds of a burst detected from a satellite that the uh, coordinates get relayed down to Earth. So um, that's a cool thing. I haven't seen that since. It's just, <laughs> just like, you know, <laughs> I mean, and you're sitting here, you're sitting here at your uh, kitchen table and these are moving in Chile and it was coming off a satellite that's, I forget how far, you know, it's just, I mean, think about what's going on here. And, you know, um, did you go to Rod's talk last night about amateur astronomy and where it's going, you know, and uh, not that this is amateur astronomy and where it's going, but I mean, we couldn't do this 10 years ago, you know, we didn't have this ability to, to do this. So. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, leave it open for some questions here, and I'm going to go see if we can get this green bank dish to move, and if I do that, we'll be able to see on that map I just showed you, we'll be able to see it um, moving. Yes. Yeah, I to told you they've been modifying the site just in time for... Um, no, I told Dan, I said, Dan, I'm going to be up at a conference with a couple hundred people. You know, he got me in, t he got me in touch with the programmer right away and said... I met these uh, two years ago. I drove down. I took two. I stayed two nights down there, and I met them. And 
and uh, you know went out and had dinner with them and they're a pretty fun group I mean they pu- they pay a guy in Chapel Hill what a what a uh, you know we're not going to get here tonight what a um, junior or mid-level software engineer would make um, here and he lives in Chapel Hill so I mean he's just like he's a big dog he just he makes all this money and he's living down there but they have to they have to pay him that much because um, you know they need they need a good program on there to make this run if I get stuck here I'm sorry we just won't be able to show it but it was working yesterday was working yesterday so let's just keep our fingers crossed here any other questions you know, if you're talking to the group and you're thinking about Skynet how, how would you say that we would benefit our, our what would we find the most interesting or enjoyable aspect well for me um, just the fact that you could do it at first was novel I thought, you know, it's like, wow, I'm controlling these scopes and, you know, the, the whole idea here is I'm going to try to show you that I'm running a server in North Carolina and controlling a dish an hour south of here, but there, there, there it goes. Um, yeah, I think it was the, the novel yeah. part of it. And then, you know, the Lagoon Nebula is easy, an easy get. Um, we have a, a guy who's part of in the club, Steve, uh, Steve Sizek, and... Um, He's doing the art program through astronomical leave, and the art program is observing um, peculiar galaxies. And peculiar galaxies are they don't have a they don't have a they don't have the um, rotational pinwheel type of formation we do what we know with more modern galaxies. When galaxies were forming early, they, there wasn't that degree of of um, structure to them. I mean, it was they were blobs pretty much until the rotational structure got got them in that kind of pinwheel um, type of configuration. Um, but you know that's it. He went off from that's what he does. He's he's not taking the labs. He's he's ab- do on, he's doing an observatory program for astronomical league, and they said he could use an, an automated scope to go get that data. Like when I got my, you know, when you go for your Messier certificate, you can't uh, you can't um, you can't use any automated stuff. You have to go do it. All right, so I'm going to give this a shot here, and then I'm going to load a job, a radio job, and then I'm going to go back to Skynet Live that I just showed you. And we're going to go look for uh, Green Bank 20, which at the moment is not even showing up on the map. Isn't that wonderful? Well, I should be able to, well, it, you know, it's radio astronomy. It's okay if it's cloudy. Um, no, here at Green Bank? Yeah. What do you mean? The color on the left-hand side of is red, so... Oh, it's brown. Okay. It looks, it looks different on the screen. No, r- bright red is, uh, is the DSO scope. That's in uh, Dark Sky Observatories down by Asheville. Exactly. Yeah, it's brown. But you should, you'll be able to see it slew if that's the case, okay? Um, so let's see if we can get that going. Just give me a second to pull up the... This would be the same as for a visual observing target. Um, I'm going to use a source that's called Hercules A. And I just took a look at what was available um, this time of day. And I'm going to add new observation. And Hercules A, I think, is this object right here 3C286 yep that hurt okay then this is uh, two years ago this wasn't quite as easy you can put an object they have a pretty deep database now you can put in an object and you'll find it right away you don't have to program the coordinates so they picked that up. Um, 
there's not much for me to go really change down here. Um, you're going to get radio observing in certain frequency bands. So do you remember on the tutorial that you saw, you get this uh, graphic, and uh, even for optical observing, maybe more important for optical observing, um, you want to be above three air mass, which is above about 18 degrees, which is astronomical um, when astronomical twilight ends. If you're doing this at night, okay, it doesn't matter because it's a daytime observation with the scope. So I'm going to save this guy. Low res. I'm not. All I'm going to do is show the dish moving here if I can get it. Um, all right, gave me a job number, 1803. Very important. If you're keeping a field book, you know, track your job numbers. Like that the way it is. Duration. Uh, let's say 90 seconds. And I don't want to repeat it since I'm just showing off a little bit here. Okay, gives you a summary of your. I had 3,600 credits, and I'm going to burn 90 credits. Maybe I don't want to do that, but what the heck? Okay, so the job's in. Um, you see it right here. The ID number is 23700. Let's go to Skynet Live and see if anything showed up. Here it is, observation 23700. Okay, the telescope is slewing. It's unfortunate I can't see it. I have to go beat those guys up a little bit because they told me it was going to be done by now. But, you know, it's a little bit like watching paint dry, but if you go here, uh, once it's in position, uh, that'll start to uh, progress left to right and you'll be able to see the the time of that coming in and then maybe go back and look at the data so okay that's about what I have here I had a little bit on this um, gamma ray burst interest group I put together 10 years ago and that was starting to get even if you ask the the, the um, uh, university astronomers and the professionals it was it was like you know it's old news until the LIGO discovery happened and now there's uh, you can imagine a gamma ray burst is probably the most energetic source of um, you know, observation we can see from Earth, um, and a gravity wave has to be up there in that same category. It just has to be some some massive cataclysmic event going on. So it's it's not too far a stretch to say, you know what, if I'm detecting a gravity wave, is it possible it's the same sort of phenomena that caused uh, gamma ray burst? Um, and one of the satellites, uh, Integral, picked up a source four tenths of a second after the LIGO. Um, detection was made for back in September. So there's great excitement about that. Um, uh, there's a, uh, a network I keep track of called the, the GCN that um, is available to the public. But it's used for the professional community and you get chatter from the telescopes when they pick out a source and they relay the coordinates to the ground. And then you get, for example, on the ground, if there was a team working with these Skynet scopes and they saw a visible counterpart, you know, very quickly after that, they just send out, you know, we observed this source da, 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 for so many seconds after the burst and down to this magnitude and we detect this at, you know, they just, they're, it's very pithy. It's kind of like our uh, email list for the club, you know, where we send out this, it's kind of a, you know, it's not really a blog, it's just that communities in real time putting out what their observations are. Um, it's run at NASA. Uh, there's a guy named Scott Bartleme who runs it and, um, the high energy telescopes and, and satellites are uh, Integral and Swift and Chandra, a few others, but the ones that pay any attention to gamma ray bursts are Swift and um, uh, Fermi and Integral's a uh, European Space Organization satellite. So they relay their um, observations and then the stuff gets interpreted on the ground. Well, LIGO is going to be on the same network. Matter of fact, they already are. Uh, there's a, an MOU, if any of you have worked for the government before, know how that, that goes. It's an agreement between uh, these research entities that they're going to cooperate and share information while they're trying to get to the point of determining, um, you know, they're, they're really on to something here. Um, I was fortunate to be able to talk to some people at NASA about this, and they want to know that they have four um, confirmed observations that they can, that they have high degree of uh, 
you know, a high degree of um, uh, certainty that it was, it was gravity wave type of an event before they put this information that's already available on the GCN out to the public. So it's on the same network, but we just can't see it. But they're collaborating, for example, if there's the, the LIGO observatories pick something up, they're collaborating with the, um, the space agencies who have um, satellites that could potentially pick up a, a source at the same time. So that all of a sudden, what, what was becoming very you know boring, everybody said, well, we know as much about this as we're ever going to know about it. It's, it's come around again, become part of something that's really relevant. So. Um, so that's it. I'll see if I got any data. <coughs> yeah, it looks like it. Now, Steve, who's our um, Steve, who is our uh, the guy doing the art program? He's done some radio observations, but I sure as heck can't figure out what he's doing with this yet or what he's looking at. So I have to get educated on this. Why there's a spike after background noise, I can't tell you. But you get an idea. It would have been fun to be able to show the, um, the dish moving. With the woman I talked to in outreach over at Green Bank, I think if I had this this particular graphic up, you could see it spike when it did the. But you see where the target is now. It's still it, the dish moved and it stayed in place. I'm gonna try one more. What do you think? Same thing. See if I can pick it up on the. And then we'll let you go. Well, I'll just do this for. Well, I'd have to move it. You're right. We don't have radio astronomy time on the scope for on the account for Novak yet, and that's just kind of an oversight. I got to get with Dan and find out if he can get that turned on. So, so any of you that who want to uh, try it out, um, no cost to you. It's something the club does. Um, you know, there's a spreadsheet I have with uh, email addresses for folks, and you know, I, I don't get too many questions about it. We some people kind of go into it for a while, and then they let it go, and they come back to it, that kind of thing. So. Um, if you're interested, let me know. Yeah, I need a uh, your name and an email address. Um, did you say AL has some interest in this? Uh, Astronomical League asked me to write an article about it. So we went to the um, like the um, the guy who's the editor for their mag for Reflector. His name is Bob. I have his card, but I think it's in my wallet. My wallet's in my car. Um, yeah, he wanted me to go. I, I've talked to him a couple times about would you like to make this an observing program through yeah, the yeah, AL. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah, I asked them, and that they, kind they of. Need a yeah, they uh, they had a guy look. They had a guy on their staff look it over, but it really didn't. I asked Dan did it go anywhere, and he said it really hadn't gone anywhere. So. Um, that would be I think so. I, I think. Mm -hmm. I like it. Yeah, I mean, it's something that uh, it just came out in discussion at, you know, the annual meeting. And uh, he asked me to do a 3,000, 4,000 word piece on it. So I, I got to figure out how I'm going to write that much about, you know, that and make it interesting. But uh, I talked to the, uh, the president about it. It might have been six months ago. And he assigned one of his folks to go take a look at it. And I just asked him the same question point blank. I said if it was something that, that the league thought was worthwhile as an observing program, would you add it? And he said, yeah, maybe, you know, he, he didn't commit. So, and then um, I put him in touch with Dan Reichert at, at UNC and I followed up with Dan. So Dan said, I hadn't heard much about it. So. But, you know, they might say no now because they're busy with other stuff and then they might pick it up a year from now. It's, it's hard to, hard to say. Well, I'm going to use the, um, you know, I picked up at the, uh, at the annual meeting, they had you know, some of the material on the table there, and I picked up the, the uh, workbook on the Carbon Star Program, and those are variable stars. So what I want to do with that, I think I mentioned it, is figure out is there any way I can measure magnitude in certain bands, because Carbon Stars are very red, or towards the red end of the spectrum, and they're also variable, so could I do something to pick up the periodicity with it? And 
oh, by the way, can I use Skynet to submit those yeah. gets? Because, you know, if you've ever done one of their observing programs, you have to document in your field log or whatever, yeah. you know, whatever you're keeping. And uh, that would work for that. So we found that out already. Steve's doing the ARP program and, you know, the irregular galaxy stuff. And I asked him the same question. He said, did you check to find out whether or not you could use the scopes um, to do your observations? And he said, uh, he said he assumes so, which makes me worry a little bit. I'd like, like to know better that he checked all that out. And I'll show you what his field book looks like real quick. That's not his field book. Yeah, this is Steve's. Um, this is Steve's field manual. So you see these. Uh, you see these images on the left here. Okay, this is NGC 5128. That's what it should look like. Okay, but he's doing these really short exposures just to show that he's been to that part of the sky and this is what he, you know, you can pick you can pick it out. You see that bright star here? And you see it here. You see that. You see that dark rill coming through the middle of it here? Okay, same here. So, so he made his field log in Word or whatever it is he's using for that. He's doing a good job with it. And so, I mean, it, this, that's another example. You don't have to do the labs for the sake of doing the labs. You can go off and do, you know, whatever suits. So. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let me give you something to... Uh, piece of paper to